And the young American individualists who populate our universities today are deeply a part of it, whether they acknowledge it or not. Unlikely as it seems then, it is still not too late to return to Western civilization and a common national culture informed by a common heritage. Welcome to the Pepperdine School of Public Policy. I am Pete Peterson, the very grateful dean of this unique graduate program. We're very excited to co-host this event with the, our friends at the National Association of Scholars, the lost history of Western civilization. At first glance, it might seem strange that a graduate policy school would have an interest in exploring issues relating to the great ideas and cultural history. After all, many of these programs tend to focus on technocratic solutions to the challenges we face, ones that will work just as well in Malibu, California, as they would in Timbuktu. But for several reasons, as my Anglican friends would say, it is meet and right to do so. Not only do we see ourselves as kind of being on the Acropolis here uh, on the Malibu campus, uh, but Pepperdine was founded, and the policy school specifically, uh, was founded to be and remains a graduate school committed to teaching the great debates implicit in the Western tradition regarding the roles and responsibilities of citizens and public leaders, debates as relevant today as they were millennia ago. The late great historian Kevin Starr was on our founding faculty back in 1997, and in a speech he gave at the opening of this institution proclaimed, and I quote, because Pepperdine remains anchored in values, it can communicate itself to the region as seeking not just numbers and statistics, not just fancy formulations, but value in our public life, by which I mean both religious and philosophic value, the philosophia perennis, the perennial philosophy, and the Judeo-Christian tradition which has shaped our civilization." Unquote. Starr concluded, it is only rarely that academic discourse refers to these values, that yet they remain implicit in all that is thought and said. At Pepperdine, we say that leaders must always remember that there is a public in public policy. Specifically, that means that leaders must consider the impact of their decisions on the public they're serving. But we also mean that leaders must understand that the particular cultural and historical environments in which they're working and to shape policies to that environment. This is why Roots of American Order and the great books in ethical leadership join stats and macro and microeconomics in our core curriculum here, named for one of our founders, Dr. James Q. Wilson. Second, we gather in a state which has become ground zero for attacks on teaching Western civilization from high school to college. Just last year, legislators in Sacramento proposed a new and required ethnic studies course for all of California's high schoolers. In an editorial criticizing the new curriculum, the Los Angeles Times editorial board, that's right, I said the Los Angeles Times editorial board, declared, and I quote, a current draft of the model curriculum drawn up by a committee of teachers and academics and headed by the State Board of Education, what could go wrong? <laughs> is an impenetrable melange of academic jargon and politically correct pronouncements. It's hard to wade through all the references, I hope I get through this, to wade through all the references to Herkstery and Wamoxen and misogyner, and cis-hetero, I'm sorry, cis-hetero patriarchy. <laughs> we have no objection, the board added, to a course that broadens students' thinking about race and gender and sexuality and history and power, but too often the proposed ethnic studies curriculum feels like an exercise in groupthink designed to proselytize and inculcate more than to inform and open minds. It talks about critical thinking, but usually offers one side of the debate only, unquote. Ironically, given the withering attacks on the teaching of the Western canon, is that taught rightly, the coursework provides the basis for debates 
and critical thinking, while those who seek to supplant it only offer, offer a hardened ideological narrative, not to be questioned. Mm -hmm. To respond effectively to these challenges will demand friendships and partnerships, what I call a coalition of the willing, which is why I'm so grateful to the National Association of Scholars and this opportunity to partner with you today in this very important set of conversations. Please join me in welcoming the association's president, Dr. Peter Wood, who will introduce today's agenda and our first speaker. Well, as you just heard, I'm Peter Wood, the president of the National Association of Scholars, and my pronoun is none of your business. <laughs> um, what follows is an exercise in cis-heteropatriarchy. Well, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted that Pepperdine University, and especially our host, the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, has provided this occasion and this beautiful James Wilburn Auditorium at the summit of one of the most beautiful campuses in the world, certainly the most beautiful location on which the National Association of Scholars has ever launched a report. I'm especially grateful to Dean Peterson for making this event possible, and I'm grateful to all of the speakers, Stanley Kurtz, of course, but also Daniel Walker Howe, Susan Hansen, Mark Bauerlein, and Wilfred McClay. We'll be hearing from them all before the afternoon is over, and I will say a bit more about the no amount of enormous knowledge and experience they bring to the discussion of Western civilization. But first, I want to say thank you for being here. It's just a delight to see an audience like this turn out for a topic like this, which these days is a bit obscure. The National Association of Scholars has been arguing since its foundation in 1987 in favor of traditional American college curricula that include core courses in Western civilization. Now, we hold that this kind of education is the best foundation for every individual student, both to make him or her aware of the long conversation within Western civilization. Such education opens the way for individuals to reach their fullest intellectual potential. But we also hold that this kind of education provides the best foundation for the flourishing of the American Republic. That our country needs a, a plentitude of <laughs> citizens whose shared knowledge of Western civilization makes the continuation of that civilization possible and enables us to know better what ideals America embodies. This form of studying helps us to learn from the experience of the past how best to preserve the government, society, and culture that transmit those ideals to future generations. In a series of studies, starting with the dissolution of general education in 1996 and extending through the vanishing West, what does Bowdoin teach, making citizens, the disappearing continent, the National Association of Scholars has criticized Americans' universities for first curtailing and then compromising and ultimately abandoning Western civilization core curricula. This was a dereliction of their duties, both to their students and to their country. Stanley Kurtz's report, released today, deals with how this abandonment happened and its consequences over the four decades since that abandonment began. I want to comment briefly on how the report came to be written. Now, I should start with a kind of confession that Stanley and I are both unlikely celebrants of Western civilization survey courses and perhaps of Western civilization itself. We are both anthropologists who started out studying the non-West, the rest, and we did that enthusiastically. Stanley and I had been friends uh, as undergraduates at Haverford College. Stanley then went off to Harvard to pursue graduate studies where he eventually took a PhD based on his fieldwork in Rajasthan, India. I pursued studies on native art and trade networks in Melanesia and went to the University of Rochester, then a redoubt of uh, British social anthropology where I focused on Sub-Saharan Africa and New Guinea. We both fled the West. What happened to the two of us makes for a longer story than I can tell, but for my part, 
I was pulled into thinking seriously about the distinctiveness of the West when I was trying to work out the differences between New Guinea cargo cults and an American millenarian movement that I ended up studying. A key difference was the Western consciousness of history. We are a people aware of our past and our place in a long sequence of social, economic, political, and religious developments. Time for us does not stand still or circle back in an eternal uh, fixed center, as is the case in many places. We have no shortage of our own myths, but unlike the rest of the world, our myths are essentially historical in character. Stanley too became caught up in the profound differences between the West and the rest, in his case, modern India. Under the influence of the great French scholar Louis Dumont, he began to dig deeper into the conceptual divisions between Western ideas of individuality and group identity and the ways such things played out in India. A major turning point for both of us was the publication in 1987 of Alan Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind. Bloom suddenly made clear that the cultural relativism in which the two of us had been steeped had enormous costs, not least of which was the loss of any kind of comprehensible account of what our civilization was. And that loss extended beyond the precincts of academic anthropology. There was a vogue during my time in graduate school for the idea that many so-called traditions are recent inventions. The uh, Marxist scholar Eric Hobsbawm's volume, The Invention of Tradition, 1983, was a key text. Why couldn't Western civilization itself be such an invention? The idea solved some problems by dissolving the West into a congeries of warring tribes like the rest of the world. If I'd paid more attention, I might have realized the hidden codicil. If Western civilization was born yesterday, why not get rid of it today? The NAS has for some 30 years argued on first principle that Western civilization is worth studying. But the NAS never directly took on the cutting edge of the anti-Western civilization movement, the born yesterday argument. Today, that changes. We come to dispute the basic premise. The born yesterday argument is just plain wrong. We should have paid more attention to how tendentious was the scholarship behind the argument, but we didn't even think about that until Stanley started showing me early drafts of this report. The Western Civ course, in fact, goes back in one form or another to the birth of the Republic, and it builds on a historiographic school with even deeper roots in Europe. The campaign to disassemble Western civilization was built on a, a lie, or if that doesn't quite describe it, some kind of willful, culpable ignorance. But a great many historians endorsed the removal of Western civilization anyway. They did so with a credulity to a badly sourced just so story that does them no credit as scholars. What they purported to believe just isn't a distortion of American education history, though it is that. The false belief distorts American history writ large. America's leaders from James Madison to Woodrow Wilson were educated in a version of Western civilization. Western civilization permeated the intellectual and cultural background of virtually all Americans. Back in my, my home city of New York City, you can go to the New York Historical Society and see Thomas Cole's wonderful five painting series, The Course of Empire, which he painted in the 1830s. It's the finest art of Jacksonian America, dedicated to an ideal typed rendition of the rise and fall of both Greece and Rome. America dotted its land with medievalizing architecture through the 19th century. Go to our capital and you will see the Smithsonian Institution building, the castle finished in 1855. It's a mixture of Romanesque and Gothic revival styles, a, a neat coincidence if we weren't concerned with Western civilization at the time. Lou Wallace could not have composed his 1880 bestseller, Ben-Hur, without building on a vast American interest in ancient Rome and Judea, or acquired a vast audience that his, if his fellow Americans didn't possess an equal interest. The lost history of Western civilization, 
just isn't the lost history of a particular college course. It's the lost history of America's enthusiastic love of Western civilization and of its own fond belief that America is Western civilization's favorite son. You can't teach American history properly without teaching that the love of Western civilization, that joyful identification with Western civilization was or could have been possible without America's school teachers teaching a version of it from the very beginning of the Republic. The Western Civilization Survey course disappeared under an attack based on factual error. Such an attack would not have succeeded had there not been a readiness to accept it. There was a cultural and intellectual context to this defeat, a moment in Western history in which self-loathing overthrew civilizational confidence. The aftermath of the Vietnam War and the 60s counterculture were the immediate factors, along with the twilight struggle against world communism. But the matter goes deeper into a long train of precedents. I think of benchmarks such as Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, in which he laments the melancholy, long, withdrawing roar of the sea of faith, and T.S. Eliot's The Hollow Men, who whisper together as wind in dry grass and encounter a meaningless dead land. Poetry gave voice to that profound demoralization of the West that began in 19th century secularization, Nietzsche's death of God, and was jolted into popular consciousness by the civilizational suicide of World War I. Of course, a civilization doesn't kill itself in one colossal bloodbath, or even two. It dies more slowly as its animating ideas cease to be taught to ensuing generations. And that's a choice. It's not something that has to happen. We choose it or we refuse it. The aftermaths continue, as in the recently announced uh, New York Times program, the 1619 Project, which aims at transforming what is left of our civilizational ideals into the belief that everything start to finish is about slavery, racism, and oppression. But Western civilization has come close to disappearing, at least from the college curriculum and the high school curriculum. And that leaves the question, what do we do now? That's a question I think best taken up after you've heard from Stanley and from the other speakers, and we'll welcome your counsel on what the answer should be. But we remain confident that the lost history of Western civilization can be recovered. It can be found, and one of the places it can be found is right here. Well, although he's just revealed my personal secrets to the general public, I want to thank Peter Wood for those kind opening remarks. The thing you have to know about Peter is he got into Harvard Graduate School in Anthropology and he turned it down to go to the University of Rochester, which of course is less prestigious. Uh, that's because he didn't like the theoretical approach at Harvard. He preferred it at Rochester. Now, that's the smart play. Um, you really should focus on the, the theoretical perspective uh, favored by the people you're working with if you're a grad student. But most grad students don't get that. Uh, they go with the prestige. So it speaks very well of Peter's character uh, that he did that. So thanks to Peter, and thanks immensely to Pete Peterson and Pepperdine for co-sponsoring this event. And thanks tremendously to the extraordinary scholars who you'll be hearing from, so kind of them to participate in this program. And thanks to all of you as well. OK, get down to business. For 12 years now, John Lennon's song, Imagine, has been played or sung just before the ball drops on New Year's Eve in New York City's Times Square. This fledgling tradition tells us a great deal about what we might call the secular political religion of modernity. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion, too. If you want to understand the source of contemporary hostility to the teaching of Western civilization, I think you can find it right there. And the sentiments behind John Lennon's Imagine motivate 
and explain our most erudite contemporary scholarship, not just large swathes of popular culture. If you'd like a more sophisticated rendering of the same idea, consider this claim from James Burnham's prophetic 1964 book, Suicide of the West. The principal function of modern liberalism, Burnham says, is to facilitate the dissolution of Western civilization. And this suicide will be rationalized, quote, by the light of the principles of liberalism, not as a final defeat, but as a transition to a new and higher order in which mankind as a whole joins universal civilization that has risen above parochial distinctions, divisions, and discriminations of the past, end quote. Academic history, as currently written and taught, is largely a brief for globalization. The idea is to undermine the public sense of national or civilizational identity. With nothing left to kill or die for, the world will presumably live as one. But while imagining a future uh, without countries might be easy if you try, Leninist historians have the vastly more difficult task of imagining a world in which nations and civilizations have never existed in the past. Is it possible to simply imagine a nation or even an entire civilization out of existence? Well, that's exactly what deconstructionist historians attempt to do. And from their point of view, it is easy because nations and civilizations were never truly anything other than imaginary to begin with. For deconstructionist historians, every collective boundary line is a flawed human construction, susceptible to debunking and especially deserving of such treatment when it encourages an in-group identity, above all, war, at the expense of a capital O, other. Over the last few decades, just about every familiar narrative of Western history has been subjected to debunking by revisionist historians. But how often are these alleged deconstructions themselves critically examined? Well, today I want to talk to you about what may arguably be the granddaddy of all historical deconstructions, the claim that the idea of Western civilization itself was largely invented, quote unquote, during World War I as a way of explaining to American soldiers why they were going to fight in Europe. Now, you may or may not have heard of this claim, but a great many historians and academics have. The idea that college courses in Western civilization were actually late and politically motivated inventions played a very significant role in the debate 30 years ago over Stanford University's Western civilization requirement. And of course, the decision to eliminate Stanford's required Western civilization course helped to usher in the modern era of multiculturalism at our universities and greatly accelerated the disappearance of Western civilization courses from the American college curriculum as well. The scholars most responsible for moving today's K through 12 curriculum away from Western history and toward the idea of global citizenship have also been deeply influenced by the claim that the teaching and even the very idea of Western civilization was actually a form of 20th century war propaganda. The origin of this thesis was a 1982 article uh, by Gilbert Allardyce called The Rise and Fall of the Western Civilization Course. There, Allardyce fingered not biblical Israel or Periclean Athens, but the War Issues course of the World War I Student Army Training Corps as the actual birthplace of Western civilization. According to Allardyce, the War Issues course taught an America once steeped in the idea of its own uniqueness to accept an alternative identity, this one highlighting the liberal democratic traditions we share with Europe. This wartime course, says Allardyce, inspired the spread 
of mandatory Western civilization classes through the nation's college curriculum in the years after World War I. Those courses flourished until the Vietnam War. Expressions were told of the alliance of the North Atlantic nations and their dominant position in the world. In sum, the Allardyce thesis suggests that Western civilization is both a recent invention and a thinly disguised form of neo-imperial war propaganda. For decades, the Allardyce thesis has been elaborated by academic historians, most notably in Lawrence Levine's 1996 book, The Opening of the American Mind, a book widely hailed as the Academy's definitive rebuttal to Alan Bloom's closing of the American mind. Levine expanded on the Allardyce thesis by tracing the history of the American university from the 18th century on. Levine tells the story of the exclusion of medieval and modern history from the classical Greek and Latin curriculum that dominated American universities until roughly the 1870s. Even ancient history received little serious attention in the 19th century, says Levine, since mindless drills in Latin grammar and deadening memorization exercises were the order of the day. Levine also describes the shift in American thinking from the exceptionalism of the 18th and 19th centuries to the very different 20th century belief in a common Western civilization. So, for example, Levine quotes John Adams warning Thomas Jefferson against importing European professors for his newly created University of Virginia. And then Levine highlights Jefferson's fears that European immigrants might fail to understand or appreciate America's democratic principles, making a point tirelessly repeated by multiculturalist historians ever since. Levine concludes, quote, the Western Civ curriculum portrayed by conservative critics of the university in our time as apolitical and of extremely long duration was in fact neither. It was a 20th century phenomenon which had its origins in a wartime government initiative and its heyday lasted scarcely 50 years, end quote. <clears throat> Yet the Allardyce thesis is mistaken, and dramatically so. It's time the debunkers were debunked. American colleges and universities have been teaching Western civilization since before the revolution well before the revolution, really. The idea of American exceptionalism makes no sense without the complementary idea of Western civilization, and the two have always been intertwined. Yes, there is a relationship between war and Western civilization, but it's far less straightforward than Allardyce suggests. And the stereotype of the mind-deadening 18th and 19th century American college curriculum turns out to be a condescending exaggeration. We are the ones who ought to be learning from our often wiser forebears who we are. Now, the claim that the idea and the teaching of Western civilization were invented during World War I might sound absurd, but it wouldn't have gone unrefuted for so long if it uh, had, hadn't had at least a superficial plausibility. It's true that the phenomenon of a single required course going by the name of Western civilization grew greatly in popularity after the First World War. So it takes some digging to show that the American college curriculum has always included the teaching of what we can rightly call Western civilization. Part of what's involved here is the rediscovery of some great and largely forgotten historical works. And recover, the recovery of these neglected classics not only refutes the Allardyce thesis, it offers us a fascinating and revealing lens on our own time. It turns out, uh, for example, that Lawrence Levine's account of American higher education in the 18th and 19th centuries is a caricature. It's true that the classical curriculum dominated that era along with memorization, note-taking, and what were then called recitations, that is, in-class responses to instructors' questions about the assigned readings. Yet until recently, we've missed the importance of what one scholar has called 
uh, quote, the informal curriculum, end quote. You see, 18th century Harvard was a poor provincial university, unable to afford the kind of specialized faculty increasingly common in England and Scotland. Harvard solved this problem by creating an official list of library books approved for, quote, common use, unquote, by students. Gradually, memorization and recitation were focused on the mastery of introductory texts during the first two years. Juniors and seniors, in contrast, were increasingly referred by the faculty to library work guided by the so-called common use reading list. Students wrote essays drawing on this approved list of library books, the best of which became orations delivered during graduation. Now, it might seem odd at first, but the most heavily borrowed book uh, uh, from Harvard's library between, uh, 19, between 1773 and 1776 was a life of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, uh, written by Scottish historian William Robertson. Of course, a biography of a powerful 16th century European monarch is post-classical European history, contra Lawrence Levine. But why should such a seemingly obscure book be so popular? Well, the popularity of Robertson's life of Charles V is explained by its book-length introductory essay, A View of the Progress of Society in Europe from the Subversion of the Roman Empire to the Beginning of the 16th Century. Although we've forgotten it, Robertson's view of the progress of society in Europe was the most popular history of Western civilization in the late 18th and early 19th century American college curriculum. And in contrast to Lawrence Levine's claim that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were too suspicious of foreign influence to want European history taught at American colleges and universities, Adams was Robertson's greatest advocate in North America while Jefferson included Robertson's Charles V with its great introductory survey of Western history in the curriculum of the University of Virginia in 1825. Harvard students in 1775 took more history books out of the library than any other subject, amounting to nearly half of all books borrowed that year. So Harvard's so-called common use reading list effectively incorporated post-ancient European history into the curriculum, well before the school could afford to hire away specialists in this newly emerging subject from overseas. And with Robertson's view to the progress of society in Europe, the most widely borrowed book, it appears that on the eve of the revolution, Harvard's juniors and seniors were studying Western civilization. In fact, it seems to have been the most popular subject. Meanwhile, John Witherspoon, James Madison's teacher and the president of Princeton, directed students in his moral philosophy course to supplement his lectures by borrowing Robertson and other synthetic accounts of European history and culture, like Adam Ferguson's essay on the history of civil society, the first known English language publication to use the newly coined word civilization. So once you understand the significance of the 18th century's informal curriculum, not to mention Thomas Jefferson's own curricular recommendations for the University of Virginia, Lawrence Levine's thesis cannot stand. William Robertson's brilliant account of the West's development in his view of the progress of society in Europe ushered in a kind of historical writing we take for granted today, but that was astonishingly novel at the time. Robertson mastered the idea of unintended consequences, yet did so in a way that preserved free rational choice as a powerful force in history. Robertson's core theme was the dependence of liberty and civilization on restraint. He attributed Europe's progress to balance of power politics in which even the most powerful nations forswore the quest for universal empire, that is, for the total defeat of their rivals. And as we're learning from new work on James Madison's unpublished writings, Robertson likely had a significant effect on the development of Madison's vision 
of competing and balanced factions within a constitutional republic. But the greatest and most influential Western civilization textbook of the 19th century was Francois Guizot's The History of Civilization in Europe. Guizot's modern champion, the political theorist Larry Seidentop, calls this lecture series, quote, the most intelligent general history of Europe ever written, end quote. And although neither Gilbert Allardyce nor Lawrence Levine know it, Guizot's History of Civilization in Europe was not only the most widely used college history text in America in the 19th century, it was also read as widely as the most popular novel by the general public. This during an era in which Americans were supposedly uninterested in any, anyone's history but their own. Uh, to illustrate the false opposition between American exceptionalism and interest in Western history, consider that Guizot's History of Civilization in Europe was first injected into the required Harvard curriculum in 1839 by Jared Sparks, Harvard's first professor of history. Yet Sparks was also the main American source for uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's thesis that America's exceptional commitment to liberty grows out of its system of local government. I suppose you could say that Tocqueville's other main source for this idea was Guizot himself, since Tocqueville's experience of listening to Guizot deliver his original lectures on the history of European civilization inspired him to look to America for alternatives to France's centralized bureaucratic state. In those days, America's exceptional taste for liberty was rightly understood as the development of a broader and long-standing European project. <clears throat> Guizot's fundamental thesis is that Europe's civilization grew out of its competing centers of social power, the church, the monarchy, the aristocracy, and the urban middle class. In effect, Guizot extended Robertson's argument about the necessary balance of state power and the dangers of universal empire into the cultural realm. According to Guizot, <clears throat> it was the failure of the theocratic, monarchic, aristocratic, or even pure democratic principles to gain unchallenged empire over the others that ultimately guaranteed Europe's progress and freedom. And Guizot's idea became central to John Stuart Mill's defense of free speech in On Liberty. Whereas early on, Mill had put his faith in what he called a clerisy, a kind of educated, secular, but quasi-religious elite that could lead social progress. Under the influence of Guizot's vision of liberty emerging from competing social centers, Mill changed his mind. Mill eventually came to believe that the greatest threat to freedom would be the complete triumph of either the elite intellectual clerisy or the competing forces of populism. Not only low forms of populist anger, but also educated and refined elites could threaten freedom with a lust for universal empire, an urge for total control. Mill knew Europe's educated clerisy well, of course, because he lived amongst them. And for his understanding of the populist counterforce to the elite clerisy, Mill looked to the rise of Jacksonianism in America. It seems to me that the last American presidential election makes sense in light of the theme of balanced opposition nurtured by Robertson, refined by Guizot, and channeled by Mill. In 2016, a perceived threat to freedom and self-rule from an entrenched and arrogant elite called forth a populist reaction. With luck, the correlation of forces in society will rebalance as a result. The danger, however, is that in our day, both the elite and the opposing populist forces may have lost their feel for liberty and for the self-restraint upon which liberty depends. Once we recover the lost 18th and 19th century history of the teaching of Western civilization, we discover that Americans were not simply taught the principles of liberty explicitly, as in a catechism. Instead, these principles were woven deeply into the fabric of the ages through the teaching of Western history.
And that story seared liberty into our bones by connecting us to an enduring civilization's heritage. Here is the deeper reason why the rising American generation is losing its feel for liberty. Liberty in the bones is lost when the story of the West is forgotten. It turns out that it isn't so easy to imagine the past away. Deconstructionist historians wrongly came to believe that countries and civilizations were simply imaginary human constructions. Once they found a superficially plausible way to dismiss the West as a tissue of invention rooted in militaristic chauvinism, it flattered their intellectual prejudice. As the saying goes, the story was too good to check. Imagining a completely globalized future isn't so easy either. The past does not simply disappear. The weight of civilization cannot be so easily cast aside. After all, the wish to undo and to dissolve competing countries and civilizations is itself a misguided offspring of the characteristically Western quest for equality. In another sense, however, fighting the West's, forgetting the West's own heritage of liberty, as John Lennon would have it, isn't so hard to do. American historians quite easily forgot their predecessors three decades ago when the Allardyce thesis took off and the Stanford decision went down. And all of this was preface to a broader social forgetting of the Western past, a forgetting not only perpetuated but even celebrated annually in Times Square. Imagining may be easy, but history takes hard work. So let us then get to work recovering and retelling the story of liberty, the story we've nearly lost. Now that is my attempt to condense part one of the report. I'll have far less time to offer you a taste of parts two and three, so please forgive me if what I say now is even more compressed. Uh, my goal in the brief remainder of this talk is simply to convey the flavor of an argument laid out in far greater detail in the final sections of the report. Okay. <clears throat> the contest between Western civilization and the multiculturalist forces that pushed it aside at Stanford in 1988 has become the central line of fracture in American society. 32 years ago, the campus culture wars were a riveting sideshow. Today, they have become our politics. In fact, nowadays, politics as culture war takes the place of what we used to call high culture. The Allardyce thesis was the scholarly wing of the push against the teaching of Western civilization at Stanford, but that was only half the battle. The more notorious attack on Western civilization was the accusation that to teach it was racist. It's easy to forget how shocking this accusation was at the time. How could a course featuring Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Dante, Marx, Machiavelli, and Darwin, among many others, be simply dismissed as racist? Nowadays, we, fa we take it for granted uh, that almost any disfavored policy position on almost any issue, from health insurance to free public college, can and will be labeled as racist. In 1988, however, the attempt to settle an academic dispute with an accusation of racism was both novel and disturbing. The accusations were taken by many as neo-McCarthyite attempts at intimidation that were completely out of place in a scholarly debate. Nowadays, a large part of what the academy actually does is to label things that don't fit the traditional definition of racism as racist. In an important sense, accusations of racism, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, and generalized bigotry, I could have gone on, of course, constitute a new kind of American culture. We might call the motivation behind this new culture, I accuse, therefore I am. <laughs> but I think the more accurate way to put it is, I accuse, therefore we are. That is to say, leveling an accusation of bigotry has become a way of securing a sense of group membership in a society where conventional social forms like family, community, nation, religion, and civilization have dramatically weakened. To make an accusation of bigotry, maybe especially an accusation that is 
difficult for outsiders to immediately recognize or make sense of, is to affirm membership in or forge an alliance with a recognized identity group. I accuse, therefore we are. The great common denominator of traditional forms of morality is sacrifice. When we feel ourselves to be deeply a part of some family, community, nation, faith, or civilization, we are willing to make sacrifices to sustain them, in ultimate instances, even to the sacrifice of our lives. The Allardyce thesis is an attempt to explode our sense of membership in Western civilization so as to prevent us from making that sacrifice. Allardyce effectively treats American soldiers in the First World War, First World War as dupes of a social and historical lie. And of course, this is the larger trend of deconstructionist history. If only we could imagine our countries out of existence, there'd be nothing left to kill or die for. So the sense of belonging that derives from the new culture of accusation works differently than it has in the moral orders of the past. Moralities of sacrifice, such as we find in traditional religion, are relatively quiet affairs, expressed through regular rituals and patterns of life. Our emerging culture of accusation is different because it depends instead upon an almost constant sense of emergency. The culture of accusation belongs to a world of individuals increasingly detached from traditional families, communities, nations, religions, and civilizations. The only community this sort of atomized individual can easily join is a movement to defend the individual rights of an unjustly oppressed class. But this means that in the absence of nearly constant oppressive assaults on some victim group, the basis for social solidarity disappears. Without the ability to join a crusade against an oppressor, an atomized individual is simply alone. We might think of this new culture of accusation of, uh, as a form of what I call moral minimalism. What comes off as the hyper-intensity of our modern moral, moral discourse is moral minimalism instead. If requiring Plato and Aristotle opposing Medicare for all or refusing to fund universal college education is not equivalent to Bull Connor's attack dogs, the moral impulse, a moral impulse sufficient to counter an otherwise groundless and isolated existence is lost. The frequency of the charges has to rise as the actual threat to well-being recedes. Minimalist definitions of morality, for example, the notions we can all agree to, such as racism and genocide are evil, cannot keep groundless, uh, groundlessness and isolation at bay unless racism and genocide turn up everywhere and often. Nowadays, they are omnipresent. But wait a minute. I've just argued that our new culture of accusation is characteristic of a moral stance in a society of individuals detached from traditional social forms. What has any of that got to do with multiculturalism? Isn't multiculturalism all about uh, defending a wide variety of rich traditional social forms from destruction by Western civilization? Actually, something like the opposite of this is the case. A better name for multiculturalism would actually be anti-culturalism. In their actual operation, multiculturalism and its newfangled incarnation, intersectionality, tend to strip various cultures of all that makes them distinctive. With oppression and marginalization as the intersectional coalition's unifying principle, the actual content of its divergent cultural components can only endanger the alliance's strength. The more Catholic the Latinos, the more Muslim the Muslims, and the more gay the gays, the less would these groups have in common. Yet the intersectional alliance only wins when everybody stays on board. Keeping members in line thus demands a least common denominator approach in which marginalization and resistance to power become the passports to identity. Your place in the clash between the powerful and the oppressed is what makes you intersectional. Everything else is a distraction. The so-called cultural components of the coalition are thus important only insofar as they influence the quotient 
of relative oppression or privilege, not for their actual content. All of this drives the intersectional alliance to downplay culture and accentuate race. Race becomes the sign of shared oppression and essentially replaces culture at the core of modern intersectional identity. Latino students and students of Middle Eastern Muslim descent are associated with very different and potentially clashing cultures. Their skin tones are similar, however. Accusations of racism thus unify the coalition in a way that charges of cultural insensitivity cannot. The key marker of intersectional identity is thus, quote, people of color, end quote. So the collapse of traditional social forms in an increasingly atomized world is driving us toward an ever greater obsession with race. In a world of radical individualists, fighting against alleged oppression is the quickest and easiest route to a sense of group belonging and purpose. Ironically, however, what today's supposed multiculturalists actually share is comfort with the core assumptions of classical Western liberalism. The racism charge is powerful because Americans almost universally share the classically liberal presupposition that human beings are by nature free and equal individuals. To judge a person by the color of his skin rather than the content of his character, or to assume that races are unequal, outrages our classically liberal souls. Yet relati the relativists and postmodernists who dominate the academy disdain and debunk the presuppositions of classical Western liberalism as ethnocentric illusions or ruses of the powerful, even as they depend upon our classically liberal sensibilities to fuel outrage at these supposed manipulations and illusions. First, they tell us the West doesn't exist. Then they turn around and call it evil, even as their implicit moral code quietly affirms the West as good. Gilbert Allardyce saw Western civilization as a bogus tradition, Yet he and other postmodernists debunk that tradition in the name of individual liberation, a value that only proves them to be part of the very Western story they deny and disown. Consider the controversy over transgenderism. For good or ill, the radical new gender norms embraced by the modern intersectional coalition are developments of classic Western and American individualism. Uniquely, among a world of societies governed strictly by collective rules of kinship and marriage, medieval Christianity insisted that young men and women should be allowed to choose their own spouses. Uniquely, among a world of societies governed by elders, aristocrats, and kings, the modern West insisted that people should be allowed to choose their own leaders. And uniquely, in a world that takes the difference between men and women for granted, young Westerners insist that people should be permitted to choose their own genders. Is this a welcome advancement of traditional Western conceptions of individual liberty or a dangerous radicalization of them? Does the ethic of gender liberation free individuals from oppression or does it undercut the virtue and community needed to balance our individualism out? Those questions and others can be answered most deeply through readings of the ancients, the great Christian thinkers, the founding theorists of liberalism, or Marx, de Tocqueville, de Beauvoir, and more. In other words, the underlying issues at stake in our debates over advancing individualism are the issues explored most profoundly in a great books-based course in Western civilization. If you are individualist enough to buy into transgenderism, then you are Western enough to read Locke and to Tocqueville. That is our heritage, and the young American individualists who populate our universities today are deeply a part of it, whether they acknowledge it or not. Unlikely as it seems then, it is still not too late to return to Western civilization and a common national culture informed by a common heritage. We can return to the West because we have never truly left it. Our strengths and our weaknesses are Western uh, because Western is what Americans are, people of color very much included. <clears throat> 
Step one is to restore and recover the history we've abandoned under an avalanche of deconstructive skepticism. Foolishly, we've accepted that skepticism on faith. The evidence now suggests this faith was misplaced. Thank you. Sorry. Before our first panel, we have questions from the audience. Questions? Yes. When I was at UVA Law School, I read a lot about how Madison got 200 books from Thomas Jefferson to Jefferson was in his friend. Do you ever, and I was trying to track down that list, has anybody ever been able to track down the list? Probably the historians on the panel that you're going to hear will be able to tell you that better. What I did was to uh, uh, look at um, Colleen Sheehan's uh, work on reconstructing later work by Madison, the, the work that he did after the Constitutional Convention. It wasn't ever fully published, but it drew heavily on Robertson and some of these other figures. Uh, Jefferson had Robertson in his library. I don't. I don't think Madison would have had to get Robertson from Jefferson because everyone knew, everyone knew about Robertson at that time. As for other things that Madison might have gotten from Jefferson, you'll have to ask the historians. Yeah. I'm Juliana Pilon from, I have to say this, the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. <laughs> <laughs> Outrageous, outrageous. Quick question. You said that racism is now the new uh, dividing line, but Clarence Thomas is black, and yet he is considered to be a racist. So is it not rather that racism is the excuse, because everybody's against racism, just like fascism is an excuse for what is ultimately, a, let's call it neo-Marxist, form of the class that we are against versus the one we are for? That's a great question. Yes, I do think that there is a neo-Marxist tone to the way that accusations of racism are being deployed. But it, it's of interest. It is neo because it's moving through accusations of racism. And what I, I'm able to go into a little bit in, in more detail in the report is what I call the expanded accusation of racism. We all agree that racism is bad, racism especially defined in the traditional way, that you believe that someone is genetically inferior, that you want to set them to be in some separate part of society and not be near them. What's so interesting is that we've had this gradual, almost unremarked at this point, expansion of accusations so that it can uh, hit on just about anything. Some people accept that and some people don't. If you really look at it carefully, I think it's almost a bit like uh, phlogiston in the Middle Ages. You know, it's, it's almost impossible to disconfirm it. It can be anywhere. And, uh, and I talk a little bit, not much, about the squad in, uh, in the report. And I think a very, very important moment was when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez implied that Nancy Pelosi was being racist because she was criticizing the squad. Now, that was, most people would say that's the ordinary give and take of politics. Politicians differ and they criticize each other. But if, if you add on to that, well, but we, we happen to be people of color, so there must have been race. How are you going to disconfirm that? And so it's the expanded definition of races, racism that's novel. But is it being put in a frame, a neo-Marxist frame? I think very, very much so. In fact, postmodernism itself is a, is a growth out of Marxism. And I discussed that in the report. Should I call people? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Are you? Are you aware, um, we read a lot about how tenure community, committees and others are enforcing uh, intellectual conformity. Are you aware of universities where there are significant efforts to create more intellectual diversity on our campuses? Um, I don't, uh, of course, there may be rare exceptions, no doubt. But I mean, there's Hillsdale, there's Pepperdine. Right. But for the most part, I don't think there are any such efforts. I don't want to take up time on it, but, but this actually is another NAS project. The NAS and I are collaborating 
on a, a state legislative level bill to bring more intellectual diversity to universities. But the bill works not through faculty or hiring because that would be an infringement on academic freedom. Uh, the bill instead works by uh, inviting people from different sides of public policy debates to speak at universities. I'll be writing about this more at National Review Online. I've already proposed it publicly, but I I'll tell you right now that several states already are introducing the bill, so it's, there's going to be a battle over it this year. I'm in K-8 education, and I was a little bit surprised that both uh, Pete Peterson and you said it starts, the problem is starting in high school. They're actually, uh, did you look at all at K-8 ed education? There's a problem with the, with the textbooks to begin with, but then you have things like the 1619 Project, just it, it just slew of things that are giving project-based learning and other uh, curriculum materials uh, that are overwhelming our, our schools. Oh, I absolutely couldn't agree more. It starts very, very early. Uh, I, of course, NAS and I were both very involved in the pushback against the College Board's revised AP US history curriculum. That's for after K-8. But I absolutely agree that it's going on earlier, way earlier. And uh, one of the problems with the, the uh, College Board approach is once, once they get um, a left biased uh, 10th or 11th grade, program, then they start doing what's called uh, pre-AP pre, uh, pre courses, which they push down as, as, uh, as low as sixth grade. Uh, but I'm, su I'm sure there are many other ways. So I don't for a second deny that. Uh, by the time people you know, enter the universities, the, there's already a deep problem. We've got a serious problem here, folks. But right now I'm focused on the, on the uh, higher ed level. But I do a lot of work on K-12 as well. Couldn't agree more. I just wanted to uh, try and clarify something. It's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, back in the late 1700s, early 1800s at Harvard and other early universities, uh, most everyone was studying sort of Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, uh, the Bible, Greek philosophy, Roman law, et cetera. How does that, how does current or, or recent uh, Western Civ curricula differ from that, the older curricula? Well, one of the things I'm arguing is, again, at, at, at the earliest period at Harvard, yes, if you look at the formal curriculum, you won't see Western Civ. But as I was saying, they, can't aff they couldn't afford to hire the professors. They, instead, they dealt with it by uh, putting the books into the library and then telling the juniors and seniors to study it. Eventually, they put Montesquieu, who is another key font of the idea of Western civilization, into the formal Harvard curriculum. I think about, I can't remember anymore, maybe 1780, something like that. It was a somewhat similar date at Yale. And so uh, the curriculum you're talking about is the official curriculum, and that was really there. But what I'm saying is there was another curriculum that was informal. And then there was a formal curriculum in the early part of the 19th century that people just don't know about. A lot of the, uh, the real, for me, the biggest breakthrough on, on this whole uh, project was finding a ob seemingly obscure uh, book uh, uh, tracing uh, the teaching of history at American colleges and universities by one of the first American historians. His name was Herbert Baxter Adams. And Adams has a detailed description, and, and he ran a survey. This was all published through the Bureau of Education. There was no Department of Education. The Department of Interior had the Bureau of Education, and they ran a big survey on how history was taught. That's where they showed that Guizot was a popular textbook and all these things. So most of what I'm talking about isn't known. The curriculum you're describing is really there, but there, there is both an informal curriculum and an initial introduction of a formal curriculum in the early 19th century that people don't know about. But in fact, if you look, you'll find it. It's on record. Uh, St Stanley, as you know, once a, a theory or thesis becomes dogma in, in an academic discipline, the adoption of it becomes really a condition for advancement for younger scholars. This is just a question. Did, after Allardyce published the essay, was that something that got him tremendous professional rewards, job offers or fellowships, things like that? Or, if you, you don't, or, or I could open the question to others. 
Well, I can't, uh, while I can't comment specifically on, on rewards that went to Allardyce, because I just don't know the answer to it, but I'll say something else, which is that Allardyce himself uh, went on from this famous article, an influential article, to write a second article, which was in some ways the article that kicked off the world history movement. And he got a lot of accolades, not just for that first article, but as uh, I, I, I'm probably going too far to call him the, the founder or father of the world history movement, but that's not too far from what's going on. So he, he, really, he really must have reaped considerable benefits from that. But for me, the interesting thing is just that, I mean, no one ever bothered to check. It isn't that hard. I mean, you have to do a little bit of work, but it isn't that hard to find out what did Thomas Jefferson and John Adams actually think about the teaching of history. And there's a book I talk about in the report uh, about um, that completely, you, you can't read this book and still hold the Allardyce thesis. It was published in 1982, the same year as Allardyce, but no one has ever paid any attention to it. Allardyce has gotten all the accolades because it, it met the, uh, but the real problem is there's, you know, everyone has their biases. There's a rumor that even I have my biases. <laughs> but but the, if, if there was real intellectual diversity, then you would have scholars that had contrary biases checking on scholars with the other. That's go back to Mill. You know, marketplace of ideas, things are strengthened by, and because there aren't people inclined to doubt Allardyce, any normal person, as Buckley said, the first 30 people in the phone book, if you told them Western civilization was invented during World War I, they would think you were nuts, and they would check on it. But nobody in academia does that. If we had people from different points of view in academia, each side would correct the excesses of the other. But we don't have that. Just have for one more question. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, Chesworth Miłosz, in his uh, noble uh, lecture, uh, Captive Mind, pointed out that in Eastern Europe, self-censorship started creeping its way in very quickly. People, you know, people fear to publish something that would be contrary to dogma. Once things become dogmatic, it, it, it becomes very difficult to risk your neck, you know, stick your neck out. Have you found that this is happening? Is, is that possible even to, to, to capture that, to see how self-censorship is now occurring? Well, I know, uh, I know academics who tell me all the time that they censor themselves, but with respect to this specific thing, I actually do talk in the report about um, one scholar who sort of tippy-toes up to challenging the Allardyce thesis. He keeps it all to his footnote. He never mentions Allardyce. He never mentions Levine. You can tell what he's talking about. You can tell he doesn't buy it. He's even arguing against it, but he kind of keeps it quiet. He sort of wants to say it, but he's afraid to say it, you know? Thank you.